We should have known better. It had been going too well. For a long time, it felt like we were winning every battle. Their side had the numbers, sure, but we had a tactical advantage. If they tried to outflank us, outmaneuver us, or overpower us, we would always counter. Even our raw recruits were scoring kills. Green soldiers, fresh from their office job, slapped on a graphics card and joined the fray. We were unstoppable. But things have taken a turn for the worse lately. There's a rumour spreading. They say there's a new kind of soldier on the enemy side. It's rare to see one. Apparently it costs more to train up. Its new equipment is expensive, but it's proving to be a formidable opponent. It has more power and speed than most of our troops can compete with. Our supply lines are running thin, and we don't know how much longer we can hold out. Some of us are thinking of defecting. Anyway, uh, gotta go. My unit's been assigned an impossible task. However long it takes, whatever the toll, we have... Games consoles were born in the 1970s to fill a gap in the gaming market. Pong, Pac-Man and Asteroids were earning a small fortune in the arcades, and entrepreneurs like Nolan Bushnell wanted to bring some of that new video gaming business to the home. Though they began as poor relations to their arcade forebears, consoles started to take advantage of their new home in the living room to tell stories. Within a few short years, the idea of what a video game was changed. A medium previously dominated by addictive coin-op shooters, platformers, racers and fighting games evolved to include more story-driven role-playing games and adventures. By the turn of the millennium, home console tech had caught up to the arcade boards, closing the performance gap and finally setting video game arcades on the road to obsolescence. A console is, or was, a purpose-built gaming box, developed to balance cutting-edge technology with affordability. Early models used basic processors, output a simple RF video signal to a TV, and accepted user inputs from wired controllers. Over time, new innovations required new solutions. As games increased in variety and complexity, new ways of running games were developed, from cartridges to data disks to internet storefronts. Computations became more complex, requiring more and more advanced architectures to process. Inputs developed, then plateaued, then went down some unusual side roads in the name of innovation. As consumer expectations increased, so did pressure to meet those lofty standards. PCs at the time were generally vastly expensive, complex machines with a more tech-savvy audience, but some of their games, and the technology that drove them, was reaching the popular consciousness. Console gamers were looking to new machines to fulfill their desires for these improved visuals and more immersive experiences. Console evolution in the 2000s was driven by the competition between market leader Sony and new contender Microsoft. Since the involvement of the PC software powerhouse in the late 1990s, consoles had become steadily more PC-like. As their Xbox consoles increased in market share, it made sense for Microsoft to narrow their focus to just one architecture, allowing the production of games for both their emerging consoles and the PC platform they already held a monopoly over. 
As games for all platforms are primarily developed on PCs, it was inevitable that their competitors would eventually follow suit. The eighth console generation marked the point when both Microsoft's Xbox and Sony's PlayStation turned away from bespoke architectures and towards the PC's x86 platform. From now on, developers would take their central game design and tweak it to fit the Xbox, Sony and PC rather than essentially remake the game for each platform. When choosing a supplier for their core components, both Xbox and PlayStation turned to AMD. However, the AMD of the early 2010s was not the dominant force we know today. They may have had their share of compelling GPUs, offering solid competition to their rivals Nvidia, but AMD's CPU options weren't quite as competitive within the industry. Compounding this, AMD's solution to the size and budget constraints of working in consoles was to use parts developed for mobile computing. While the GPUs would prove to be their saving grace, holding up to the challenge of ever more graphically intensive titles throughout the generation, the Jaguar-based processors, made for the 8th gen consoles, would prove to be one of their greatest weaknesses. Nevertheless, Sony and Microsoft's flawed first entries into the world of x86-based consoles would go on to define PC gaming for the next seven years. Consoles of the past had defied comparison to PCs. Their unique architectures made such comparisons mostly irrelevant. You couldn't pick up a cell processor from Best Buy and build a PC around it. This led to a certain kind of thinking around console game discourse. A game that ran poorly on a given console, it could be argued, wasn't because the console wasn't powerful enough, merely that the game hadn't been properly optimised. That is, that the programmers failed to adjust the game's code to account for the hardware's shortcomings. PCs take a different route, usually leaving it to the gamer to do their own optimizations. If you can't run a game at a smooth frame rate, the onus is on you to ensure your PC meets the minimum system requirements. A PCMR gamer with deep enough pockets could afford to brute force a solution, using their overpowered gaming battle stations to drag their sliders all the way to the right, but gamers on a budget were accustomed to making their own compromises, running benchmarks, dropping quality settings and resolutions, and editing config files to eke out every last frame from their potato PCs. Can it run Crisis? Sure, if by Crisis you mean whatever the hell this thing is. The 8th generation would be different. Now it was possible to directly compare game performance from PC to console. For a budget PC enthusiast, this was like discovering that God can bleed. Okay, that's a terrible analogy, but bear with me. From that point on, cross-platform games should be at least playable on a PC that matched the console's specs. Once it emerged that the AMD parts within the 8th gen consoles had consumer equivalents, it was effectively open season for console killers. As of about a year after the birth of the first 8th generation consoles, a nascent genre appeared on YouTube. One example of this new kind of PC build was the Potato Masher by YouTuber Germ Gaming. At the time, used PlayStation 4s were evidently selling in the US for about $350, and Germ Gaming had been challenged to build a used PC for about the same price. The resulting PC would then be put to the test in the latest cross-platform game releases and compared side-by-side -side to the console version. To this end, the masher itself was imperfect. Although most CPUs released in the 2010s could equal or exceed that of the console, his choice of GPU would not age so gracefully, and the initial build lacked sufficient RAM, requiring a $25 upgrade shortly afterwards. Regardless of this, by now, the floodgates were open. The template for the console killer was created, and the years that followed would see many others imitate and refine on this formula. Before long, gamers were undercutting consoles dramatically, 
dropping cheap yet powerful graphics cards into office surplus PCs or even old machines rescued from the trash. If you could get this kind of gaming performance from a machine that is cheaper, upgradable, doesn't require a subscription, and can also be a PC, they would argue, why would you buy a console? AMD's hardware spec defined how to make a console equivalent PC, but it was the industry at large that enabled the console killer. AMD's reputation for the quality of their CPUs declined in the following years, struggling to compete with Intel's dominance of the marketplace. Game development reacted to the paltry capabilities of the Jaguar by sidestepping it where possible, placing more emphasis on the GPU. As a result, for the bulk of the generation, it was accepted that an Intel i5 with four processing cores and high per-clock performance was more than sufficient for running games. While AMD licked their wounds and worked on their next generation of CPUs, Intel, for their part, reacted with complacence. Rather than spend the years from 2012 to 2017 innovating and pushing the industry forwards, they felt satisfied to iterate on previous models. Although their new processors improved IPC, or instructions per clock, and efficiency with each release, there wasn't much incentive for gamers to upgrade from even a 2011-era Sandy Bridge i5. Nevertheless, Intel continued to offer a new release every year, with each launch having a knock-on effect on the value of older processors. For the console killer PC, this meant the used market would see a regular influx of high-performance CPUs and matching motherboards at substantial discounts. While CPU development stagnated, GPUs were an arms race. AMD's graphics cards released in 2012, bolstered by their association with Sony and Microsoft, proved to have incredible longevity. The company's strategy for the next few generations was simply to refresh their already successful video cards at lower price points and focus their development on premium products like the R9 290, 390 and Fury series. In this area, however, there was serious competition. Nvidia challenged AMD for consumers' hearts and wallets, and this battle is perceived to have driven the GPU industry forwards. For the PCMR, this brought the promise of newer, more obscenely powerful cards to push higher resolutions and quality settings. But for budget gamers, this meant that console-equivalent graphics cards would become progressively more affordable. For the first half of the 8th generation, then any sufficiently cheap PC running a CPU more powerful than a Jaguar and a GPU equivalent to an HD7870 was likely to qualify for console killer status. Although it was standard practice to offer a mid-gen refresh, for most previous generations, this had been usually a refinement, either to improve profitability or simply offer a compelling new revision of an existing product. Sometime around the middle of the 8th generation, however, both Microsoft and Sony seem to have reached a similar conclusion. Game development, now sharing oxygen with the ever-evolving PC platform, was exceeding the limits of their ageing hardware. 4K, we were being told by TV manufacturers, was the future. Yet, if gaming was going to help take 4K mainstream, there needed to be a dramatic improvement in hardware. Thankfully, AMD presented a solution. As of 2016, they had pretty much washed their hands of the high-end GPU race. In the mid-range, however, their Polaris cards would prove to be a wild success, offering previous-gen flagship performance to consumers for as little as $200. This was the technology that would go into the PlayStation 4 Pro and Xbox One X. Bumping up the GPU power of the Pro consoles didn't dissuade the console killers. Not only did the RX 480 graphics card exist before the Pro consoles were even launched, they also had a knock-on effect on the price of other, similarly performing graphics cards. 
As a result, the Pro Console Killer videos hit YouTube before the Xbox One X and PlayStation Pro even released. Reclaiming the performance crown from PCs, however, doesn't seem to have been the goal of the 8.5 gen consoles. Instead, it seems like this might have been a tactic to establish the viability of a two-tiered console lineup and to introduce console gamers to a version of the PCMR mentality. The ninth generation was expected to be released in 2020, after an avalanche of pre-release hype that, frankly, would have made anyone with even a passing interest in PCs dubious. The rumoured specs were that both consoles would feature 8-core Zen 2 processors, the latest generation of Navi-based GPUs, and super-fast PCI Express SSDs. Doing the mathematics based on 2020 prices would have put a console equivalent PC at $1,200 or more. Now, there's a sort of standing assumption among the public that consoles act as loss leaders. We assume that they can only sell for the prices they do if Sony and Microsoft voluntarily make a loss on the hardware sales, though this may be underestimating the phenomenal purchasing power of global mega corporations. Regardless of the real economics of the matter, nobody really thought consoles with these kind of specifications would launch for $500 in 2020. The Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 launched in time for the holidays in 2020, with specifications exactly as rumoured. The Series X and PS5 were priced at $499. The PS5 Digital Edition, omitting the 4K Blu-ray drive, came in at $399. So I have to take a moment to acknowledge my own skin in this particular game. I have for most of my life been a PC gamer, but never a part of the PCMR. I was always one step behind the curve. I had a 386 when the Pentium launched. I couldn't afford an Athlon, so I bought a Semprom. I had a Core 2 Duo rather than a Core 2 Quad. I held onto my GTX 260 for six freaking years. The point is, I've always made compromises when it came to PCs, and I learned early on that this meant I'd never have the full PC experience. Console killers changed this. I came back to the PC enthusiast space after an absence of a few years during which I sort of lost touch with how tech was progressing. On watching series like Potato Masher and Scrapyard Wars, I realised that the new paradigm for budget PC gaming was much healthier than before. For a while, at least, there was a kind of equilibrium, where the latest tech wasn't a must-have to play the latest games. Coming from my early days as a PC enthusiast, where CPU clock speeds increased over a hundredfold in just over a decade, and each new graphics card release effectively obsoleted the previous one, it was refreshing. In 2016, like many of us who've spent any time watching Brian at Tech yes City, I started selling my own console killers, built out of cheap used parts. I'd slapped together a system out of a G41 motherboard, modded X5450, 8 gigs of nearly obsolete DDR3, a 500 gig hard drive and an R9270. It would cost me about £150, it would sell for £200, and I'd be safe in the knowledge that I'd just sold a PC that would keep the new owner satisfied for at least a year or two of gaming. For my own PC, I learned to be more savvy with my purchase decisions. When Skylake was the cutting edge of Intel's lineup, I bought a Sandy Bridge Extreme. When the RX 480 launched at £200, I bought an equally powerful R9290X for half that. This became every bit as important to me as being on the cutting edge was for a PCMR gamer. That wasn't to last, of course. The wheels of industry keep grinding forwards, my own finances improved and I started caring more about having the latest and greatest, but I still hold on to a kernel of that used price performance mentality, and I intend to bring that out more in my PC builds on this channel in the future. Just the other week I released a video showcasing a £750 build with a mix of new and used parts. By my own standards it's a pretty killer system, 
though after running it through tests at what I could ascertain were approximately the same as those on the 9th gen consoles, it still didn't quite make the grade as a 9th gen killer. And that's a problem. I was originally going to go on a tirade about the scalper pandemic, what exactly happened, why the market is the way it is, and what it's done to budget PC gaming, but you know, you were there, you are there, you've seen the rocketing prices, the empty online stores, the rise of everyday people trying to make a buck on hardware scalping and crypto mining. The console market looks like it might recover soon. As I write this in April 2021, scalper prices on Xbox Series X are barely 20% over retail, and not that much higher on PS5. Soon there may be little or no console price gouging occurring at all. The same can't be said for the PC market, where graphics card scarcity is driving prices ever upwards, and optimistic estimates for an end to the madness are still in the second half of 2021. The problem here doesn't lie exclusively within the scalper pandemic though. Even if it ended tomorrow and the price of new cards immediately returned to normal, the lowest end card in the current range that could hope to compete with a 9th gen console is the Nvidia RTX 3060, a card that launched at $330, that's just $70 less than a PS5 digital edition. AMD have at least at the time of writing, yet to announce their own competing card. The RX 6700 XT and 6800, which at least architecturally are the closest literal equivalents to the console GPUs, would cost more than a console even at their suggested retail prices, and there's no reason to think that a hypothetical RX 6600 would cost less than half that. At least, not if it's going to be worth having. There are used options, of course, last generation's RTX 2080 and 5700 XT, and the older 1080 Ti and Vega 64 should all have enough power to drive modern games at console-like settings, mostly minus the ray tracing, but not one of them is selling for a price that makes them a contender for a console killer in 2021. To kill a 9th generation console, then, isn't a realistic option. At least, not for now which leaves budget PC builders, for the time being, stranded in the last generation. There's no better kind of meme in tech than the misguided prophecy. If I go making predictions for the future, even just for the next 12 months, I risk being the next 640k should be enough for anybody guy. That being said, I've already taken a few risks in this video, so in for a penny, in for a pound. The first Potato Masher video went up 14 months after the launch of the PS4, in January 2015. I'm going to go out on a limb and say you won't be seeing a compelling, repeatable $350 9th gen console killer build by January 2022. It will take something like the launch of Nvidia's next range of cards, whether it's the 3000 Super Series or 4000 Series, to start pushing viable graphics card prices below $200. There will be outliers, of course. I dare say Brian will put on his Bogan voice and score an RTX 2080 for $150 sometime soon, but that's why I said repeatable. Of course, something could occur that would accelerate the process, an event that would see used graphics card prices come tumbling, and we've seen it happen before. One of the biggest drivers of GPU prices during the scalper pandemic has been crypto mining. The cost of certain specific cards is often directly associated with the value of coins like Ethereum. Right now that seems to be the RTX 3000 series cards, though in gold rushes of the past it was AMD's cards from the RX 400 and 500 series. For a while this resulted in a golden age of mid-range AMD cards on sites like AliExpress and eBay, with X-Mining cards regularly selling for as little as $70. 
Now, there's no guarantee this will happen again soon, and even if it does, and supplies of new stock are still short, we won't see the kind of fire sale prices we did in 2018. If we're lucky, and crypto crashes after PC prices have returned to normal, we may well see a new golden age. Floods of used X-Mining RTX 30 Ti's selling for 150 bucks or less, aiding and abetting in a console massacre. But I'm no financial whiz, nor am I an expert in crypto. Maybe we won't see current GPU prices come down until they're well and truly obsolete. And that would be a shame. Without viable GPUs, budget gaming PCs will eventually struggle to run new releases, especially if graphically intensive games like Cyberpunk 2077 and ray tracing exclusive titles like Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition are any indicator as to the future of gaming. As I write this, I'm aware that perhaps I'm too close to the cloud to see the silver lining. The console killer gimmick was a big part of what brought me back into the PC enthusiast community, and my videos are inspired by the console killers that came before me. Right now, in a world where being able to build economical gaming PCs feels simultaneously incredibly frivolous and yet crucially important, it also feels like a distant memory. To any newcomers to the world of gaming, it must appear that the console gamer argument was the most valid one all along. That the PC community is elitist, that the rich can have the best performance and everyone else has to put up with a substandard experience. And I don't want to live in a world where console fanboys are right. Jokes aside, I have to concede that, for at least the immediate future, the value prospect of ninth generation consoles is insurmountable. Bravo, mega corporations. You've undercut the competition with some surprisingly competent products for once. Sleep with an eye open, though, because if that crypto bubble bursts, once supply returns to meet demand, and once the world finds some semblance of normality, we're coming for you. May 2021 is Console Killer Month on Iceberg Tech. There will be a playlist for the series on screen at the end of the video or in the description. Also, if you enjoyed this essay style of video, let me know in the comments. This is a new format for me, but I'm something of a sucker for video essays myself, and I thought I'd make my own. White Light, Ahoy, and H Bomber Guy have been huge inspirations for me, even down to my fake British accent. I don't recall seeing many other video essays in the PC building community, so this might either be a great idea or a big fat waste of time. If you'd like to directly support me, I have a Patreon link below. Thanks for watching. Kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.